not in the office tomorrow, but I need. Uh, okay. Yeah, I need I literature and Jewish philosophy. We will have a few minutes for questions at the end of our program. Please enter your questions into the chat area for this conference, and I will read them to Professor Kohlbrenner. And now I present, present to you Professor William Kohlbrenner. Hey, people. I'm just getting myself. I'm sharing my screen here. Everybody sees it? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So first mm -hmm. of all, thank you, Al. Thank you for inviting me to this. And I'm, I'm very pleased that you you mentioned the, um, the achievements of Varyalan, both in the sciences and the humanities. Um, and we feel as part of the humanities in the English department that we are a very vital part of the university. And uh, we spend a lot of time and energy really kind of spreading our, our achievements. One of them is an international creative writing program. I just want to mention that here because so often, especially at Bar London and universities across the world, the humanities get forgotten. And I just wanted to mention how important the humanities are to the university. I think it's very important to the American friends to know that. So that said, thank you. And today um, I'm, I'm talking about BDS. And Alan, thank you for describing what that is and the holiday of Hanukkah. I mean, in a way, there's really nothing new under the sun. And one of the things today that I'd like to do is to see the relationship between the Hanukkah story and what we're living through today. And I'm hoping to do this in a way that's responsible, that is really sensitive both to the historical moment then and to the historical moment now. Um, what I mean is I'm not, I, I'm not gonna, I'm I'm not gonna play fast and loose with history. Um, In a way, I, I was thinking before this talk that there are, there are really two primary kinds of anti-Semitism. The sages of the Talmud identify four different kingdoms. The first kingdom I think is Babel, Babylonia, then Persia. Then the third is, is Greece, and the fourth is Rome. Hanukkah really revolves, as we all know, around that third exile, which we'll discuss in a second. Um, the exile, I, I think these four exiles are ways for the rabbis to talk about different kinds of anti-Semitism. And the Greek and the Roman are, are distinctive. And I, I would describe them in, in, in two different ways. So the first, you know what, I'll just use images here. This is, this is what in, in rabbinic literature is associated with Rome, the replacement ideology the supersessionist ideology. That is, we are the Jews. We are the real Jews. And in order for us to be the real Jews, and you can fill in the blank, uh, early Christians, Puritans, right, who are appropriating the Jewish tradition and saying, we are the chosen ones. That supersessionist perspective is, is a very particular kind of anti-Semitism. We will replace you. I mean, this is Charlottesville, of course. There's no safety in America. No party is protecting the Jews. I mean, I say that from Israel, but there is right-wing anti-Semitism, and that's really not our story today, because this is right-wing anti-Semitism that's associated with Rome. We're really interested in what I'll call progressive anti-Semitism. I don't like, I, I don't, somebody mute whoever's talking. I, I, I don't, I don't like, um, talk, yeah, some, thanks for muting. Um, I, I don't like talking about, whoever's running the meeting, can you just mute everybody? Thank you. Um, so, here I am, sorry, I was talking to myself, now I'm back. So there are, I don't like to, I was saying I don't like to use the word woke because it's so terribly pejorative. I prefer I prefer progressive anti-Semitism. Now this picture is from two, 2017. I'm sure some of you will recognize this as the Chicago Dyke March. This was a march organized by feminists and really what people who called themselves intersectionalists. Are people familiar with that term? People use that term? People, you can just nod. 
people know what intersectionalism is? Non no, Alan. So intersectional, I, I, it's hard to describe really, but it's intersectionalists, I think, would describe themselves as a coalition of difference that are coming together in unity to fight racism and oppression. Donna, that's a pretty good definition, right? We'll, set, we'll settle with that for the moment, right? Now, what was interesting about this dike march in 2017 is that Jews were told to leave. Zionists, people with signs um, that identified themselves as Zionists, like this one, the Israeli flag, were asked not to participate. There was another more recent one. This is the Philadelphia food truck controversy. I don't know if you guys know that one. Um, so there was a there was a, a, a kind of food festival and everybody had all the nationalities brought their own food trucks. But the food truck of this guy, you can see Moshava, right? He was told not to be part of it. So this is another intersectional gathering, right? In which there is a claim for a certain kind of universalism, but where the Jew is excluded. I mean, intersectionalists, and the way I, the reason I'm saying there's a claim of a certain kind of universalism is they're all joined together against oppression. But at the very moment that they're all joined together against oppression, they, they exclude the Jews. So one of the things I want to talk about tonight is the nature of that exclusion. Why must the Jews be excluded? And, and I think there's, there's a kind of logic to it. And this applies not only to these kinds of gatherings, but I think what's troubling to, to me as a humanist is the way they've taken over the academy, the, the humanities in, 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 in America. And there is a deep-seated anti-Semitism, which is born out of this intersectional commitment. We are committed to intersectional ideas, freedom, liberty, but not the Zionists. And, and not the Zionists because well, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so I do have a handout, which we're not handing out, technology such as it is. Um, and I wanted to segue from the discussion of contemporary left anti-Semitism, which we'll come back to, and now move to the Hanukkah story. Now, um, Paul, the Apostle Paul writes in the letter to the Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek. I mean, so we could talk about the two kinds of anti-Semitism. There's the replacement one, the Christian one, and then there's the assimilationist one. And the Greek one is the assimilationist one. Okay? And we're going to spend a little time talking about what was particular about the Greek exile. I mean, the first thing that we should mention is that of all of the exiles, Jews were actually in Jerusalem during this exile. They were not, I mean, and you can think about it in a way. For Rome, when the Catholic Church takes over Jerusalem, the Jews get pushed out. There's not room for two people. However, for this assimilationist notion, this assimilationist idea of, of, of exile, the Jews are somehow still there. So we have to think about, well, if that's the case, what is the nature of the exile? And we'll talk about that. So here is from a, a, a Jewish uh, legal text, and it's describing the difference between how people celebrate Hanukkah and Purim. And we'll get a little insight, I think, from the contrast. I put the Hebrew for people who are interested. So the, the Assyrian Greek Hellenist, Antiochus, did not decree to kill the Jews and destroy them. In contrast to the Purim story, where Haman wanted to ex exterminate all the Jews. But rather, what did the Assyrian Greek king want? To cause them such suffering that they would abandon their faith. For if Israel had submitted to the Greeks and abandoned their faith, they would have been satisfied. So we can see right away the distinction between the story of Purim when Haman wants to destroy all the Jews. And interestingly, the way we celebrate that is since Haman wanted to kill the bodies of the Jews, we celebrate with our bodies. The Greeks, however, 
they were not interested in our bodies. They were interested, I don't know what you want to use it, call, call it your conscience, your faith, your identity as a Jew, and provided, provided that you gave up the specificity of your Jewish commitment, then you were fine. Then you could blend in with everybody else. And interestingly, really, the, the celebration on Hanukkah, as opposed to Purim, is not physical, but it's, uh, it's a holiday of praising God. Hoda'ot. And it's really- Professor, and, and it's Professor re should we yeah. still be looking at the Moshava image or are we expecting us to be looking at something else? Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, I'm, I'm sharing my screen and, it's, uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not looking at the Moshava image. So thank you, uh, Alan, for interrupting. I'm the only one um, getting it, but maybe, maybe okay. my screen's unusual. Let, let me try again. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks, Alan, for pointing that out. And I'm gonna share my screen again. And I'm going to share my desktop again. And how are we doing now? Uh, much better. Thank you. Perfect. Good. Okay. So I hope you people follow through with that. We're making this distinction between Haman and Antiochus and the two ways in which they wanted to punish the Jews, in one case, destroy them, in the other, assimilate them, and show us in some way, or will begin to show us what's specific about this Greek exile. So the Maral of Prague, which many, many of you may know, you can visit his grave in, in, in the Prague Jewish cemetery, the 17th century figure. So he is writing, trying to define for us or helping define for us what it is that defines the Greeks. So the Maral says as follows, the wisdom of the Greeks spread from all sides, the length and breadth of the world without limits. Is that true? I mean, we, we can say in some sense that the, that the culture in which we live really oscillates between Athens and Jerusalem. And the, and the, 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 the legacy of Athens is still with us, reason, enlightenment. The Maral is saying, yeah, this, I mean, the Maral has good things to say about the Greeks, as do the rabbis of the Talmud, so that they were, of, of, all the, of all the peoples of the world, the Greeks were the wisest. The rabbis also learned that there are two languages in which you can read from the Torah. You can have a Torah scroll written in Hebrew and a Torah scroll also written in Greek. So they give a strange kind of authority to Greek wisdom. And the Maral here is reflecting that. And for this reason, the Greeks did not oppose Israel except for their adherence to the Torah. And this was the whole essence of Greece, to nullify Israel's connection to the Torah. I know we have a varied group of people here, but maybe I'll, I will ask a question here. Do, do people know what, what are the common things that the rabbis say the Greeks um, uh, may, prohibited with their decrees? The certain mitzvot. Okay. Things that didn't make sense. Um, well, there was uh, maybe. I mean, they certainly would have asked questions about that. But I think there are three particular mitzvot that the Greeks, the rabbis say, and certainly it may have been more, but the rabbis wasn't emphasized. It, wasn't it uh, uh, circumcision, Shabbos, okay. and Torah? Okay. So, uh, no. I th well, they did. So Torah is one of them as well. Let's add a fourth. Circumcision, Shabbat. And also Rosh Chodesh, the blessing of the new month. So what, are the, what do those three things in, have in common? And why is it that the rabbis emphasize those three things when describing what the Greeks did? You can think about it for just one second. Uh, right. Go ahead, yeah, somebody wants to answer? Probably because uh, the, the uh, Greek tried to enforce those uh, among the Jews. I, I'm sorry, no, so I'm asking, I'm asking for the, I'm asking, maybe I didn't understand your, your, your answer, Lawrence, but I'm asking for the, the reason the Greeks would have wanted to undermine these particular mitzvot. Oh, so that's applied the rabbis. Okay, go ahead. The, the, right, I, 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 I did, I, I asked it in a confusing way, sorry, yeah. They were particularistic, you know, okay, in other so, words. Uh, uh -huh. So what do you mean by that? What do you mean by particularistic? 
Well, in other words, it wouldn't be something that you could come by yourself. Like if you would say mm. you can't murder or you can't mm. steal and so forth and mm. so on. Those are mm. particular ritualistic mitzvahs. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to. I, 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 I really love the word particularistic because I think that's what really informs all three of them. But the way I would emphasize it is that all three of these mitzvot emphasize Jewish particularity, and it's the Greeks could not tolerate the assertion of Jewish particularity. You, can, you cannot make a higher claim of wisdom than us. I mean, this is really the beginning of, an enlighten, of, a, of a tension between revelation and enlightenment. And the Greeks, the Hellenistic Greeks, much later than Plato and Aristotle, the Greeks look at revelation not only with skepticism, but they say, you know, it's okay, you can make your claims to knowledge, but don't make a claim to knowledge that's, that, is, that surpasses those of others. And that's why you said Torah is one of the important things, Torah study was one of the things that was not permitted. But let's, let's do the other, the other two, or the other three. So what about circumcision? So circumcision, of course, emphasizes the way the Jew marks his body, the Jewish male marks his body. The Jewish male distinguishes himself from other men. And even in the Greek world, where the uncircumcised was thought of as a certain kind of beauty, the Jews reject, they, they pushed away from this. They rejected this and, and, and through their very bodies showed their distinctiveness. So that's the first. I think Rosh Chodesh in a way is the most interesting, the blessing of the new month. What would be problematic about the blessing of the new month? Well, who cares? Who cares about the calendar? Well, in many ways, I mean, everyone really cares about the calendar because time is the way that we structure our lives. And the Jews were insistent not to agree with the Greek calendar, a solar calendar, but to create their own calendar. And especially Rosh Chodesh, as many of you I'm sure know, the rabbis have the power depending upon the testimony that they hear, they declare what, when the new month is. There's, in the rabbinic world, there's an emphasis on human agency. We're making this time. This is our time. So that's another thing that would have upset this Greek notion of universalism. That is, any form of Jewish particularism becomes threatened. We don't like revelation, or you can't claim it exclusively. How about Shabbat? This is always the one I find a little bit more, more difficult, but I think a way of understanding it is when the Jews keep Shabbat, when they keep Shabbos, they are showing their distinctive relationship to the creator. I guess that's the easiest one in some sense. I mean, and everybody actually, you know, if a Jew keeps Shabbos, everybody knows it, right? Oh, Shomer Shabbos, right? It changed. You immediately have a different image of that person. The Jew who keeps Shabbos is a person who you see is claiming this intimate relationship to the divine. So all of those things were aspects of particularity that Greek universalism had to reject. Okay, so let's look at the next quotation. Um, this is also from the Maharal near Mitzvah. And here's something to think about. I keep on mentioning, um, and uh, Lawrence, and I, I, I know I, I've been answering, asking questions in a confusing way, but I keep on mentioning the rabbis here because the rabbis are here telling the story. It is their story that they're telling. You know, there's an article every year in Haar, it's called The Real Story of Hanukkah. Has that come out yet? You know, The Real Story of Hanukkah? There are always these articles in, in, in the Israeli publication Haar, it's, and anything, anytime you see an article that begins with a real story, you should probably ignore it. The idea is, uh, the idea is that, well, the rabbis got it wrong because if you look at history, all these other things happened. And a lot of other things did happen. But here the rabbis are telling their story in a particular way. And in a way, part of the whole Hanukkah experience is seeing and understanding that story. So the Maharal, he says, and he's emphasizing this part of the story, even though the Greeks assaulted the temple, they did not destroy it. Similarly, they did not pour out or destroy the oil, but rather they made it impure because they wanted to blur the distinction between Israel and the nations. The desecration of the sanctuary and making the oil impure 
took away the sacred status of the oil. It took away the distinctive status of the oil. So the Maral is really asking a question here. The question he's asking is, well, if the Greeks were so set on, on um, upsetting this ritual of, of, of lighting the menorah, why didn't they not just burn it, right? That would have been better. Get rid of it. But the Greeks in this story do something else. They render it impure. Why would that be significant? Maybe the concept of holiness makes no sense to them, and they could just mm. do the min most minimal thing and uh, well, well, get for, well, for sure. Way. Well, for well, for sure, the concept of holiness that is that that is what the Greeks are rebelling against. That concept of holiness, and we know that they brought in they sacrificed pigs inside of the temple. They turned it into, into a gymnasium. In a way, you could think of it, and I think this is one way of thinking about Hellenistic Jews, is on the certain, and I'm talking about in this period, that on the surface, they look like Jews. But when you dug deeper, there was no depth. And that's what, that's what Maharal is talking about. They took whatever was internal that made this thing holy, and they erased that. But they kept the outside. We know that in the four exiles, the only, again, the only case where you have something like Hellenists, meaning people who are like the people who are conquering them, is Greece. And I mean, in, in Rome, it's, there, 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 there can't be any, any Jewish, I mean, people who aspire to a, to a Roman cultural status. That's not who the Romans were. But there are such a thing as Hellenists. So when the Maharal describes the oil in this way, what he's suggesting is this Greek exile was a kind of internal exile, that people kept the externals of what it meant to be Jewish, but internally they had no sense of what that was anymore. But let's move on a little bit. Oh, this is interesting also. So, we mentioned Torah and you guys reminded me to put Torah on that list. And this is very much, this event that gets described here is very much part of the, of the Hanukkah story and understanding the nature of the Greek exile. So we know that there are different fast days in the Jewish calendar. We don't have to do that right now. And what's the next fast that's coming up? Hands on buzzers, please. Asservatives. So what what do what are, what do the Jewish people fast in Asservativet? It's a good fast because it's really short, right? It's right after Hanukkah, right? It's a wintertime fast, except if you're in the southern hemisphere, I guess, right? Then it's a bummer, right? Um, right. So all of the fast days have something to do, are part of the sense. story of at the start of the story of the, the destruction of, of the temple. But there is an additional reason given by the sages, by the rabbis. On the eighth day of Tevet, the Torah was rendered into Greek during the days of King Ptolemy. And darkness descended upon the world for three days. So we get to reaffirm the craziness of the Jewish people by seeing now that Jews fast over a translation. I mean, there are other reasons for fasting, of course, but the rabbis say the 10th of Tevet, it was, they, they say the eighth year because some sources say they fasted during the days of eight, nine, and 10. And in addition to fasting over the destruction of the temple, they were fasting over the translation. Now that really kind of begs questions. Why would the Greeks, why would the Greeks, the rabbis, decree a fast on a day that the Torah was translated into Greek? What's problematic about that? Now I'm actually asking a question that maybe you can answer. Yeah, what's problematic? About so that? is this a reference to the Septuagint or is that a separate? So I, I, I think whoever's saying that, for sure, this is this is a, a definitely <laughs> Shelley. Oh, hi, Shelley. Um, this hi. is definitely a, a reference to the to the Septuagint. And okay. we know that the rabbis themselves 
record this. Remember the story about how, why it's called the Septuagint. Ptolemy sure. asked the 70 rabbis to come and to provide a translation. They all go into separate rooms and they provide the same exact translation. That's another story. So, but yeah, I go ahead, Shelley. That, I, yeah, yeah. I, I would say that the, the fast is about uh, not only assimilation, but an attempt mm. to eradicate the particularism itself. Mm. Um, that's right. Because oh, so the, that's, the translation that's, that's, is symbolic of that. Maybe because the Torah was given only to Jews and then to try to universalize it uh, is, is, as this woman said, taking away the particularism. Mm. Well, because they were forced to translate it as well. That was part those, of the story. Those, the, the, those are both great answers. And Shelley is a former, is a Bar-Ilan alumni, for, for, right? A, for an, a, a humanist alumni. So yeah, let me, let me, so why don't you guys just go back on mute and let's just think about the two things that were suggested. Um, I mean, so it's not, I, I thought somebody was gonna say, oh, well, we don't like translation because things get lost in translation. And that of course is true. With that said, it's also it's already built into the Torah. The rabbis say that Moses had already commanded that the Torah be translated into 70 different languages at some point, right? That the Torah would be translated. So I think Shelley is right to emphasize that it's, it's not just that it's a, something gets lost in translation, but there's something particular about what the Greeks are doing with the Torah. I mean, I, and, and I, I guess... Once they translate it, doesn't it depend it on who? Change. Doesn't it depend on who's doing the translation? If the Jews are translating it, then at least the mm. Jews know know what the Torah means, is supposed mm. to mean, and they can translate it. Mm. But if the Greeks are translating it, they, they have no idea how to translate it accurately. Well, well, but that, there's well, the that, added aspect of being forced to translate. And when, mm. when you're being forced to translate for a foreign audience, you have to think about that audience. And you might mm. sometimes alter the translation mm. a bit because you fear the reaction of that audience. Mm. If you say, if you translate right. something accurately it, that they find offensive, right. there goes your head. So, Right. So I think also it's the particularity of the Greeks doing it. The Greeks want the Torah for the Greek library. Now I should say this is a tremendous partisan of libraries, but I want you to really understand here what the problem is with the translation. The translation is, is that the Greeks are doing it. And by doing it, they're putting Jews in the world encyclopedia of religion, right? You're, you're just like everybody else. It's really a, a very important part of the story we're telling because it is this kind of leveling gesture. This book, and I think it goes even further. Actually, what's I, the, yeah, let, Shelley, let me I, just continue for a second. Yeah, sure. w w yeah. So what's the difference between reading a book in the library, or is there one, and, the, and, and reading Torah, let's say, in a house of study, a Beit HaMidrash, or at home? I mean, in, in some ways we may do the same things in different places, but what the Greeks want is the kind of attention that they, what the Greeks want is Jews to have the kind of attention that they would to any other book when they read their own Torah. It's just another book. It's the conception of reading. When you're in the library, you read in a different way. And this is really the tragedy of Greek exile and the tragedy of progressive culture in a, in a way is the inability to engage in a relationship. And what the Greeks say is don't go there. Don't go to that relationship because it's compromising. Any kind of relationship you will have is compromising. And the Jew, I mean, the Jews are, we bring relationship into the world. We bring relationship through revelation into the world. We have a relationship with the divine. And we understand the importance of that relationship for our identity. I don't know. I mean, I think I read, I mean, I love Milton and I love Homer and I love reading lots of great European literature, a lot of great Greek literature. But I think my form of attention is a little bit different when I learn Torah. I just think it's different. The way it, the way it defines me, or maybe, maybe in some ways, 
people can have that relationship with, with Greek works as well. Let's put that aside for the moment. But what the Greeks were interested in particular, it's like they want to turn, um, they want to have like an, a, an Epcot exhibition of all the religions of the world. And they want the Jews to just be one part of it. That's it, right? Don't make the special claim to revelation. And of course, that special claim to revelation is what continues to cause anti-Semitism in the world because Christians just cannot deal with the Jewish call. I mean, it's not only Christians. So let, let's, let, let's just pause for 30 seconds. I'm gonna drink some water and have a little bit of coffee and then we'll transition back to, to BDS. One of the things I like about Zoom is you can do this more easily, pause. Yeah, good, let me pause. I do wanna read this one last passage because it does resonate with something that's already been said. Um, so here is from another Midrash and a, the rabbis are creating a drama between Moses and God. So Moses requested that the Mishnah should also be given in written form. The Holy One, blessed be he, however, first saw that the nations would translate the Torah, here's that reference to the Septuagint, and read it in Greek, and then claim, and the Hebrew is, Anu Yisrael, we are Israel. It's an extraordinary midrash, right? What are the, what are the, what are the, the nations of the world going to do? Moses said, let's translate the Mishnah in, 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 or let's, make, let's write it down. Of course, we know it has been written down because it had to be written down. Otherwise, it would have been forgotten. But Moses says from the very beginning, let's write it down. Let's write down the Mishnah. And God said, foresees that the nation would translate the Torah and read it in Greek and then claim Anu Yisrael. We are Israel. How are they doing that? What is the nature of that claim? Let's continue. And, and, and the, the, the Midrash continues, this is God talking. The Mishnah represents the mysteries, and here the Greek word is used, mysterion, I'm not, I don't know Greek. The Mishnah represents the mysteries of the Holy One, and he gives his mysteries only to his children, and this is the oral law. This, there's so much here to unpack. I mean, the first thing we see is, let's just take it step by step. The first thing that we see here is that through the translation, the Greeks, can, they can say it's our own. I mean, in some ways we can say there are two honor Israels. There's the honor Israel of the Romans. That is, we are the Jews and you don't exist anymore. And I think there's also the Anu Yisrael of the Greeks, which is Paul, we are all Greeks and we are all Jews. If everybody has this interpretation, the oral law is what gives the specificity to the Jewish people. They know the mysteries. A colleague of mine told me, mysteriorin, the Greek word was the way in which the Greeks referred to the most sacred part of their mass, the Eucharist. That's like, that's the, for the, for, for Christians, the Eucharist is the place in which the holy resides in the, in the world. And the rabbis used the Greek word and were saying, this is our mystery. And our mystery is not the Eucharist, but our mystery is the, is, is the Torah. Is, our mystery is the life of living, of, 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 of being living Jews interpreting, interpreting the Torah. I just wanted to say when I, when I was reading this, I think it's, it's very misleading sometimes when you see a rabbinic text refer to the oral law. Because on one hand, the oral law is the Talmud and the, what the, the lenses through which you are meant to understand the written law. But in another sense, I think the oral law is the way, or Torah Shabal Peh, it sounds better in Hebrew. It's the way in which a Jew interprets the Torah through the way she lives her life or the way he lives her life. That, the, that we are all, it's not just rabbis, we are all agents of this oral law because we take what we know about the Torah and we bring it into our worlds 
And if we and we should all have our specific styles and ways of being because we're all different. Just like to put that in. I think it's really essential because sometimes the way rabbis represent this, we just see like the only people who have a place in the oral law are people learning in yeshiva all day long. And that is not true, right? Our lives can be embodiments of the principles of Torah. We are the living law. Um, so here, in, in, in primarily we see that in this drama, God is emphasizing the particularist nature of the Jewish people and what distinguishes them, again, is the way they live God's law, their particularism. Okay, so now I said I did want to return to, to BDS. Mm. May, I, may I ask a question? Please, yeah. My, my understanding is that, mm. that the oral law given to yeah. Moses was given to Moses so that Moses could properly teach the, the, the written Torah to mm. people so that mm. people would mm. correctly interpret it mm. so that we would understand what God really wants us to Good. understand, that, right? Excellent. Good. I'm right. with you on that. Yeah. Right. So therefore, uh, we, the Jews, have mm. that oral law. We know how to interpret the Torah. And okay. so that's what, made, yeah, like you were saying, that's what makes us unique. Mm. And look, the Talmud, what is the yeah. Talmud? What's the end product of the Talmud? The end product of the Talmud, uh, as far as I know, is the, the halacha, which is the okay, way. Good. Okay, I, I, good. I, I, I don't see who's speaking. Who, who's talking now? Richard. Richard, Richard. Oh, hi, Richard. Hey, Richard, and, sorry. And like you were sorry, saying, I, 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 Richard, I, I, let me just wait a second. The, the halacha defines, tells us, the Jews, how to behave. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, Richard, I, I hear that, and and I and I, and I really I, and I appreciate your I appreciate your comment, and I know that I'm speaking in ways that other people don't, and I'm learning the oral law and oral Torah somewhat metaphorically. I understand the I understand that that halacha is what comes out of Talmudic discussion, but I, you know I, I wrote a book about Rabbi Soloveitchik, and he he says in some place that every Jew should have their own style, and if every Jew doesn't have their own style, they're not being Jewish. So that's that's where I'm getting it from, and I, I hear your your question. Um, so after this after this discussion that we've had so far, um, can we see re a relationship between the Hellenists under the exile, or the Jews under Hellenists, and the world in which we live in today? I mean, one of the one of the disturbing things about the attack on Israel is that some of the attacks are coming from Jewish people. And in some sense, they really are Hellenists. Think of Peter, Peter Beinart, for example, whose work you may have read. And I think we should emphasize here, I just read a piece by him in which he said, you know, you, anti-Semitism and, and, and anti-Zionism are not the same thing. Well, guess what, Peter, they are, right? And the distinction between them allows anti-Semitism to continue under a different name. It's, it, and really, we see that the, the Zionist movement is Israel's contemporary expression of individuality. And the world cannot take it, right? And especially, so th there's this dynamic on the progressive wet, wet in the progressive West in which Israel is not only problematic because it's a Jewish state, it represents everything bad about the world. Israel represents the epitome of enlightenment, which somehow became very bad. It represents the epitome of religion, which of course is very bad. It represents the epitome of nationalism. And it's like, and all of the anxieties that people have about the nation state, and people do have them, get sublimated in relationship to Israel. I mean, every nation state has its dirty laundry, right? But Israel's dirty laundry, that's what defines it. So anti-Zionism becomes a way to make anti-Semitism acceptable again. It's the acceptable form of anti-Semitism. And we see people within the Jewish world. It's almost as if they're saying, we can't handle this particularism. We'll leave it to the non. We'll we'll leave it to the Christians. We'll leave it to the Universalists. B 
because being, I mean, and that's because being Jewish has an enormous responsibility, the responsibility to that particularism. And that's what intersectionalists feel like when they want to exclude the Jew. And it's not, as I was saying before, it's not just that, well, you know, Jews are one of the groups. It's, it's just that we can't include the Jews. They're, 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 they're a, uh, their difference just can't be included. It's not just that. It's that intersectionalism, like early Christianity, defines itself in opposition to the Jew. The Jew, the Zionist, represents everything that intersectionalists can stand. So when a Zionist shows up at the dyke rally or shows up selling hummus or falafel, people will say, no, you don't belong. And not just because we don't like Jews, it's because you represent everything that we're up against. And I mean, in a way they're right. I mean, in the modernist literary movement in the early part of the 20th century, James Joyce writes Ulysses about return. T.S. Eliot returns to the classical tradition. What do Jews do while these people are writing these things? I mean, modernists are really out of fashion now. What do Jews do? They make a state for themselves. They actually return in real life. And modernism, Eliot, Joyce, is way out of fashion now because you don't go back to the past. You don't go home but the, because we don't even acknowledge there is such a thing as home. So I, 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 it makes sense that postmodernists, I hate that term, but I'm using it, intersectionalist progressives, look at the Jews with such disdain because we represent everything that they despise. That sense of revelation, that sense of chosenness. God, chosenness has really gone out, right? That's one of the, that's one of the great gifts that, chose, that the Jews have given to the world, to, to feel chosen. And I don't think it's only for Jews. The idea that one chooses oneself, this idea that, I, not, and chosenness is not just a passive thing that I'm chosen, I'm chosen to be choosing. And, and that free will also disturbs people. Jews and, and Greeks for sure have a very, very different conception of time. Greeks have a sense of time, which is dictated by fate. And we believe in a kind of providence, which is open to freedom. And, and in many ways, you know, the intersectional world is a product of a certain kind of Hellenism. I mean, what I, I was, I didn't look for it earlier, but during the, the war in May, there were organizations across the academy, um, feminists for Palestine, Jewish studies people for Paris, Palestine. And what's very interesting about all of these uh, petitions, and they're written in really the most vulgar, polemical way. It's embarrassing to be an academic, not only because of the position, but because of how they're understanding politics. Um, and, and throughout their letters, they keep on talking about justice and, and truth and good. And of course, where do all those concepts come from? They are, they are, they are, we, for better or for worse, we introduce them to the world, right? And they're basically appropriating that language and saying, no, we'll do this now. And Hellenists are happy to say, yeah, take over, you do it for us, right? We'll, we'll, we'll give in, we'll give in to enlightenment because it's easier for us and we like it here. And um, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's on Hanukkah is a time really to, to reaffirm. And now I'm getting back to, I'm now getting back to Hanukkah and what I think the experience of Hanukkah should be. The Rambam, the 12th century um, philosopher and halachist, he writes in his, in his legal um, compendium, mitzvah ner Hanukkah, mitzvah chaviva hi ad ma'od. The mitzvah of lighting the Hanukkah candles is very, very beloved. Chaviva ahi ad ma'od. Now for, Ram, for Rambam, the rationalist, this is him like jumping up and down with enthusiasm, right? He doesn't write like this, not in other contexts. The, the, the double emphatic, I think I've seen chaviva someplace else, but ad ma'od is unusual. And the, the um, medieval commentators argue about what is the real, I mean, it comes from the Talmud, what is the real nature of the, of the Hanukkah mitzvah? Is it the, the lighting of the candles or the placing of the candles? Now, people who know the halacha, we know we say it's the lighting that actually is, but it doesn't make the dispute about it uninteresting or irrelevant. From one perspective, when you're, when you're lighting it for, when you're, the, 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 
the, the, the side that says that the lighting is the mitzvah, that's for you, the person who's lighting it. The person who says the lighting, the mitzvah is the placing, the mitzvah is persomenis, that is spreading it out. It's funny, we say the mitzvah is the, is the hadlaka, the lighting, but nonetheless, we still call the Hanukkah lighting the persomenis, we're really accommodating both perspectives. And I think one of the reasons that, that this mitzvah is so beloved to the Rambam is because you're not only lighting it for others, you're lighting it for yourself. You are lighting it for yourself, and in lighting it for yourself, you're saying, I am committed to seeing differently. I said before that the rabbis tell their story, and they know they're telling their story. They know when they institute Hanukkah the year, the year after, that they're seeing it from a very, very per specific perspective. But when you see the Hanukkah light, when you see the Hanukkah light, there is a sense in which you are acknowledging through this miracle that the natural world is not all there is, that there's something beyond the natural world, that in order to see and understand the natural world, you have to have a sensitivity to miracles. I'm sounding a little bit, uh, oh, let's keep on going with that. I have to be sensitive to miracles. And, and, and when I see the light in, in a certain way, then I understand the way the rabbis are telling the story. That is their story. It is our story. It's a story that we tell. It's a story that we see. And in some ways, Hanukkah is about having that kind of perception, not only of Jewish particularity, but really, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, in a way, it's a kind of Jewish revelation. Of course, we know that in the liturgical calendar, um, Hanukkah comes before Purim, but it's, it's the latest thing that happens in Jewish history. So the rabbis refer to this Greece is a time of darkness. And the Hanukkah candle is a commitment to seeing light, to seeing revelation, even in darkness. Meaning at the beginning of Jewish history, we have Har Sinai, divine revelation. At the end of Jewish history, when God stops revealing himself, this is the end, Hanukkah is the end. The last miracle is this little light. Being able to see this little light, that makes all the difference. Because through that, it's not only a question of, the identity of the Jewish people, it's of individuals choosing. And we have to keep on doing that in a world which says chosenness is, is out. Well, we're still chosen and choosing. So I'm happy to hear some questions now. Let's like take a minute break. I think uh, uh, Shelly's had her hand up for a while. Yeah, well, she was she was like that in class also. So just, <laughs> go ahead, Shelly. Go ahead, um, Shelly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, I had I had a, a few thoughts that were kind of floating through my head um, give, as you were talking. Give me, give me, give me the give me the best stuff so we can hear some other people as well. So let's hear your best stuff. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, how to choose? Um, so the idea um, that you were talking about earlier of interpretation of a text, mm -hmm. I think. I was sort of thinking about that and thinking um, that the context for that is is really mm. what we're talking about here. It's the context that's mm. very important. So you could say that Torah Shabbal Peh is like the context mm. for the Torah. And mm. that is literally the traditional Jewish culture. It's the entire Jewish tradition mm. is mm. In, mm. encompassed it's, by Torah Shabbal Peh. So it, if it, you it's what we would call it, it's what it's what we would call in Greek nomos, if you remember that term. It's all encompassing. Yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Shabbat. Yeah. Okay. So if you if you translate the Torah and you don't do anything with the entire tradition, the entire Torah Shabbat mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and the whole Jewish culture, you are, you know, to use one of the <laughs> popular terms today, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're engaging in an act of cultural appropriation, an act of even erasure. Because you're I, I, you're I, stripping that away, and you're you're placing your own interpretation on top of it, and that can lead to outright anti-Semitism. And one of the simplest examples I can think of is um, yeah. the uh, the stereotype that Jews have horns comes from mm -hmm. the mistranslation into English of Carmeo from um, mm -hmm. Moshe. 
So Kevin is... Let me just focus on what you were saying earlier. Okay. This idea that Judaism is this living tradition. I mean, I think that's... That, that one can't like... I, I, I was just thinking that a Jew knows what the Jewish library is. I mean, that's kind of like a prerequisite. If you have, and to know the Jewish library is to begin to know, and in Jewish library can be understood in very expansive ways, but to begin to know, and this I think is what Shelley is talking about, the context is not only at a particular moment, we, we have part of this 2000 year old rabbinic tradition, which we are a part of. And to acknowledge that history is a very important part of our identity. So that's great. So thank you, Shelley. Victor, yeah. Um, yes, I'm on. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, that, um, that, this, that some people make distinction between the, the Jews and, the, and, the, and Zionism. And, and mm. I think that even for the ones that are sincere about it and may not be anti mm. they still mm. doing the same what the Greek uh, probably, and you mentioned mm. it. Okay. Yeah. Mm. That they don't they they don't mind that we will survive as Jews, we'll keep our religion. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. They don't want yeah. the statehood, or they don't want that Jews are a nation like other nations mm. and mm. They take the spirits from us, but they will leave mm. the body. There's a famous literary critic who passed away pretty recently named George Steiner. He's an amazing literary critic and wrote some very, very interesting things about the Holocaust. But he does write this piece, a Jewish person saying that the Jews are better in exile because it's, 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 that, that's, it's the fear of embracing particularity and its responsibilities. Um, that the Jews somehow betray their inner essence by having a place. The Jews are wandering. Uh, uh, what what strikes me that uh, that Israelis are doing it and they don't understand they cutting the the, the the trees they are on if the Israelis without uh, the, the Israelis the, the non-religious Israelis should be more concerned about it than, than the, the the religious one. I mean, Israel is different though because because Jews who are living here really are 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 part of living out the destiny of the Jewish people. And I think that's the important thing, the emphasis really. You know, people want to just say, well, Zionism is this nationalism and we don't believe in nationalism anymore. But part of our identity as Jews is fulfilling our destiny in, in, in Israel. Now it's not messianic times and we're not expected to live in the greater Israel because that's not, that's not what's, that's just not politically possible now. But we do, we, I think people have to recognize and that's what people like Beinhardt refuse to recognize, that the destiny of the Jewish people is in Israel. I'm sorry for people who don't live in Israel, but I think that's true what I'm saying. Anybody else have any questions? Did I miss anything uh, in the chat? Yeah. Bill? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I was, uh, when you're talking about how you know the, the the BDS people, various progressives, jump on Israel mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. you know point to Israel's faults. You know, even though every country has its own dark history. Exactly. I was yeah. a little bit reminded of in the last year how there are certain mm -hmm. politicians in the United States, like the governor of California mm -hmm. and the mayor of San Francisco and a few others, who are very strong about imposing lockdowns on everyone and insisting everyone mm -hmm. wear a mask because of COVID. And then mm -hmm. Gavin Newsom is at a big time fundraiser with big donors in a fancy mm -hmm. restaurant and no one's wearing a mask and no one's sitting far apart. And then not long ago, the, the mayor of San Francisco was seen dancing in a okay. club with no mask. Yeah, like, okay. So it's kind of like some of this denunciations of Israel looks as though like you see your Sunday school teacher doing something wrong and say, oh, you're telling us you're, you're the righteous one and showing us how to live. And oh, look, at you, look at what you're doing. You're dropping bombs on Gaza. You're doing this, you're doing that. Did you, right. do you think that resonates? Um. I'm still thinking, I'm now, I'm flashing back to my, my earlier Sunday school teacher. Um, I, 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 I mean, I think the, the, the way in which, I mean, we all know, I, I just got distracted Joel, to tell you the truth, but the democratic I wasn't sure about, I, I don't want to get into American politics by any stretch of the well, no, imagination. No, no, I don't either. I'm just saying what, what is the, just as an analogy. 
Like okay. you see someone who's uh, preaching oh, I see. about righteousness well, okay. acting right. in not so great of a way. Oh, I see. Right. So, like well, it anyway. well, well, that's, I mean, that's the old claim against Jews, right? And Jews have this, uh, and Jews among themselves, right? The, the certain prejudice, a special prejudice against people who are ostensibly advertising they're living a Jewish life and then in some ways not living up to our exp expectation of how Jews should live which is very important, but the, the, the Jewish style that we have to others should be virtuous. Yes, Richard. Yeah, I really, I really like what you had to say about, um, you know, that uh, the oral law that we live, like the way we mm -hmm. live, the way we behave is, you know, is, is like an, it's, it's like part of the oral law and style that we, you know, we, we each have our own style. Um, just wanted just to ask you to clarify. Do, so do, do you also think that, that, um, even though we ha we each have our own style, that it needs to be not inconsistent, not inconsistent with halacha. I'm, I'm, I'm not a rabbi. first. I'm not a rabbi. I think I think my 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 mission, and I'm not a rabbi, is that people learn how to read. You know, read your, read the text in your tradition, right? I mean, to me, that's what Hanukkah is: is getting a person to. I mean, I, I have a, a friend and he heard about some woman who's learning in a Beit Midrash. He's a very religious, you know, religious sociologically. And he's like, ah, come on, how can you do that? Why is she learning Talmud? And I'm like, thank God she's learning Talmud. She's connecting to Judaism. Let her do whatever she can know. Like, thank, let people do what they need to do. Can't fight with each other. This territoriality about, you know, movements and things like that. And also the belief somehow, as I said before, that the left or the right is going to protect us. It's not safe on any side. Right, and that's why Jews have to stick together. And the way they do that, I think, is by sharing their common library. In some ways, listen, I know I'm being an idealist right now. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I'm not going to exclude people because they don't keep the halach. No, no, um, but, I'm not a but I'm not a rabbi. But I'm not a rabbi. So I'm here. So here's what I think. I'm an English professor. Yeah. There. Yeah. I wasn't going there. I wasn't going there. I, I mm. just, just, the, the, you know, theoretically, I'm just saying, mm. you know, theoretically. Mm. Uh, Ought we not to aspire to, uh, you know, be consistent with the halacha or, or, you know, or... you know, you know, I tried in, in an earlier manifestation of myself, I tried to get smicha in a kola, which was learning a Hilchot Shabbos in, in Meishar. And it was an interesting experience, which one day maybe I'll write about. But thank God I didn't pass the exam. Because I, I'm much happier being an English professor. So I don't have to, my, I mean, my, and I'll tell you what I think about Shakespeare and Milton. But you know about keeping the halacha. Ask your local Orthodox rabbi. Ask anybody. I don't know. I mean, you know, make your own connections. We are at the top of the hour. I don't. I, I'm sure we could probably continue, and and if we want to, uh, we still have 30 I participants. I, but I think people are really enjoying this. Um, I, I'm I'm glad they are. I, I have I have uh, I'm giving a, a class a little bit later on, so I'm going to take a break. But thank um, you, thank you very, thank you very, very much for hosting. I really enjoyed this. And uh, we have to thank you too. Uh, it, it reminds me of the uh, from uh, of uh, something from Tanakh. I think it's from the Haftorah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So hopefully you won't have that problem. Um, okay. Anyhow, so I, I want to thank you for a most enlightening presentation, and. Uh, and, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, ha have you written all this down? If you have, uh, it'd be great. We have a recording, I think, that might be available of this. But, uh, but do, you, do you have and any articles? I got to start Googling you. Oh, well, and, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm writing a book. The book that I'm writing now is addressing a lot of these issues. Okay, so um, we're going to be uh, interested right, in getting but, that book. But I, 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 I am glad the American friends are here, and I am going to reiterate what we really did today is only possible because we know what the humanities are. And I'm sure everyone here at some point, whether they're a scientist or an engineer, at some point they learned how to read. And maybe that actually happened in a humanities classroom. And it doesn't happen. Other things happen in, in, STEM, in STEM labs and in nanotechnology laboratories or whatever. But what we're doing and, and you know the most important things in the world, except for what actually we're doing, which is the reading. And only the humanities does this. I mean, you know, in, in, the, in the university. Of course, we would like to think Jewish education does the same thing. But at bar Ilan University, there's not only Jewish studies, which we should support, but the humanities are a central part of the university. People have to remember that. All right, people, th thank you very, very much. Wow. Well, so so uh, I, I, I want to thank you again. And what you just said is sort of embodied in what I'm going to say now. Mm -hmm. um, 
during this festive time and as we near the end of the secular calendar year, I hope you'll consider supporting Barilon because we're going to support the humanities as well by doing so. The extraordinary contributions that BIU makes to the state of Israel are made possible by its stellar faculty, like the one, the person we listen to today, and its outstanding student body. I think we heard from the students too. But never forget that all this is made possible by you, our steadfast and loyal donors. You are part of the BIU family. And it's your generosity that holds the key to our success. I hope you'll join me in supporting Bar Ilan University. Please visit our website, afbiu.org, and make a donation at forward slash donate. Your generous support is critical and deeply appreciated. Please join us next Wednesday, December 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time, for our next AFBIU webinar. Financial expert Jonathan Gudima will present to us on getting ready for December 31st and the changing of the charitable giving tax laws. To register for this enlightening presentation, please visit, visit our website forward slash tax laws. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Thank you for joining us today and my best wishes to you for a very happy Hanukkah. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Call to be well. Oh, oh, oh Bill? Are you still there? I guess not. Okay. <laughs>